there are two major players in the book of Revelation and many descriptions of those players. One player is, of course, Israel, and the other player is Rome. And the uh, interaction of these two players is something we're con confronted with and faced uh, throughout the book. And uh, it, it's easy to, I think, it's just a little bit confused about who's doing what and the relationship of these two and what is God doing to these two players on the scene. Uh, and uh, we struggle to make some sense out of it from time to time. We're going to pick up in the middle of verse 6 of chapter 17, simply because whoever put the verses in didn't necessarily put it in the right place. <laughs> and we read, When I saw her, and that is, of course, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, the abomination of uh, the earth's abomination. That's what he's talking about. When I saw her, I marveled. Uh, and that would be uh, perhaps no surprise. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? Apparently, the angel expected uh, John to perhaps grasp this better than he grasped it. And uh, when he was amazed at this uh, uh, woman, uh, the angel says, well, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Now there's two players here, the woman and the beast. <coughs> They've both been introduced and we're told here by the angel, uh, I'm going to explain these to you. Now, that's always very helpful when you get God's explanation of a passage. Uh, although sometimes uh, it gets um, even a little bit more complex. I said, I'm going to explain to you. Now, he starts by explaining the beast, not the woman. In verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Uh, <clears throat> that's his beginning uh, explanation. Notice the similarities with several verses in the Bible. For instance, Revelation 1.4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is about to come. You see the similarities there. In verse 8 of chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Chapter 4 and verse 8, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now, it appears that what we're being told here is that there is a counterfeit uh, player who wants to convey to the world, that it has these qualities of deity, uh, counterfeit qualities to be sure. Uh, this beast was and is to come and is, is about to rise from the, uh, is, uh, excuse me, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the <coughs> bottom of the spit, or is about to come. So this formula that we have read about so far in the book of Revelation several times is being used to describe this uh, player, this beast. As Jesus Christ is portrayed as an animal, a lamb, and so his counterpart, uh, counterpart is being portrayed also as an animal of some type. Uh, I say of some type because you remember it was a animal of composite parts from the book of Daniel. And it's best to simply call it a beast. And a beast, of course, has qualities that are very dangerous and frightening and irrational. And so this beast, uh, under discussion here, fits that quality. Deity-like implications or efforts by itself to imply deity in the Roman Empire, of course, and the Roman emperors ascribed to themselves titles 
a bad day and called himself uh, God, Son of God, and uh, things of this nature, which the early church refused to uh, subscribe to. And, if, and, and, is, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Well, its source, its origin is hell. Just like Satan or the dragon we read about uh, came out of the abyss. And so his institution, the beast, also is from the abyss. And it's going back to the abyss when this is all over, so to speak. That's its destiny, whereas the destiny of the Lamb and his followers is heaven. The destiny of the beast is the bottomless pit, the abyss. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> we read about this beast earlier, actually. We read in Revelation 13, not too, too far back, in verse 3 where it says, I saw one of its heads as if it had been slain, and its fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. So, let's see if we can pick up on that theme here in chapter 17. Uh, this calls for a mind with wisdom. I, I think that the, uh, uh, the angel here is, is saying to us, uh, in some sense, put your mind to this. You're, you're going to be able to figure this out. It takes a little thought, takes a little, you know, insight, takes a little wisdom, and so we're called to use our mind. This might be a good point in time to note that the Scripture often calls us to wisdom. They have whole books, like the book of Proverbs, which teaches us how to be wise. Uh, <clears throat> we have also in the New Testament, the book of uh, James, has similar qualities of what we call wisdom literature. <clears throat> we have Paul and others telling us to grow in knowledge uh, time and time and time again. That's important because we appear to live in an era in which knowledge is uh, not considered particularly important. Uh, we're, you know, focused on the emotion of our faith. Now, the emotion of our faith is good, for that matter. I don't think wrong with that. What makes it wrong is the neglect of the knowledge, the wisdom that we're called to have. And the preeminence of emotional response instead of intellectual response. When we're called to faith in God, we're called to believe a, a body of information. We're not necessarily called to emote in reference to that information. <clears throat> not that there's anything wrong with emoting to that information. But we are called to believe some things. So we're called into the kingdom through a thought process. Because when you believe something, you exercise your mental capacities, you embrace mentally some things. And so, <clears throat> the angel here is saying, I want you to use your mind, I want you to think. Uh, there are some complexities here, calls for wisdom, and then he explains it. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, I mentioned earlier that the woman the harlot here, is seated on the beach. Here she's said seated on the mountains, same thing. And I made a point I thought that was important because those who would identify the woman as Rome would have Rome sitting on Rome, which 
although not utterly impossible, uh, doesn't strike me as the best description and picture of what's going on here. It strikes me we have Jerusalem, or Israel, being supported by Rome. And that's the picture we have. Uh, eventually, Rome turns, the beast turns, and rends this one. But for ages now, for quite a long time, uh, Rome has supported uh, Israel and given her special privileges and law and uh, appointed their high priest and made sure that their, uh, really their religious system and the, and the, the people that uh, made up that system were secure in their position and they knew that and feared Christ because they feared that uh, uh, if they varied from you know the Roman precepts on how to live so to speak how to worship then the Romans would come and take away these privileges and uh, so they recognized the necessity of keeping Rome happy since so they are um, the seven heads are seven mountains. Now, from antiquity, Rome was known as the city that sat on seven hills or mountains. Same Greek word. And so, that being the case, in other words, that's just not simply a modern term we use of Rome, which we do actually use. Of, how many of you have heard Rome identified as the city that sits on seven hills? Anybody? But me? Okay. Okay. Catch up. <laughs> uh, that is from antiquity and people will metaphorically to this day refer to uh, Rome as the city that sits on seven hills but it's not a new concept, it's an old one and that's important because sometimes we'll read the Bible in terms of our modern culture and apply it backward and, and it doesn't apply backward these terms are modern terms if you see what I'm trying to say they were not in the culture of that era, therefore, that application is erroneous. But in this case, the application is correct. Rome is a city that sits on seven hills. And for somebody to throw that term, that metaphor out, not many would miss what is being said here. The woman sits on Rome. That is, is supported by Rome. Uh, seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Notice the uh, angel goes on to say, they are also, that's that word also. It's an uh, interesting structure here because you have uh, the uh, beast being described with one metaphor, seven hills, and right in the middle of the sentence, he's going to use another metaphor. It says he, that he is by saying they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he does uh, come, he must remain only a little while. So now we've moved from the geographic identification in a certain place, a city called Rome, to the political identification of its rulers. Now, I, uh, I find that the explanation I've provided on those rulers is to make satisfying as to who these rulers are. And by saying that, I want to make sure that uh, I, I mentioned that others reading this passage would come up with a different list. Especially this would be important if you felt the book of Revelation was written somewhere around 90 A.D., then you'd probably be searching for, uh, you know, emperors, uh, the, uh, five are dead, what is, and, and the question would come to your mind, you know, in 90 A.D., who is the one is in 90 A.D.? So you come up with a different individual than what I've come up with. But since uh, I, I believe the book of Revelation was written around 62 or so, uh, <clears throat> then that sort of presupposes 
in my point of view, who these emperors are. Interestingly, from this point of view, my list starts with the very first emperor. Otherwise, you've got to start in the middle. You see what I'm trying to say? The list of emperors, you'd have to start in the middle someplace if you were in AD 90, and then start counting for five that are dead, one is, and that, that type of, of thing. And so you, the arbitrariness of picking up in the middle of the list would be a problem. I don't have to do that. Caesar was the first emperor. You see what I'm trying to say? Caesar killed and destroyed the republic and became its first emperor. And so when you begin <coughs> with Caesar and you count five emperors uh, that have died, five have fallen, uh, you come to the sixth, uh, Caesar Nero, who reigned between 54 and 68. Died, uh, committed suicide, I think, June 8, 1968 uh, AD. Uh, and uh, this is the emperor who was alive when John wrote, because uh, John wrote around 62. Well, he'd been the emperor from 54. And uh, Again, if he wrote around uh, uh, 62, then he didn't die until 68. So this is the one that he is. And then he says there's one that has not yet come. Now, Galba took over when uh, uh, Nero killed himself. But he was only emperor for about six months. And he was murdered. And so his was a short period of time. Uh, <clears throat> and when he comes, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not and is an ape, uh, but it belongs to the seventh, and it goes to destruction. Now the question here is, well, what about... <clears throat> uh, Assuming you think the eighth is Vespasian, as I did. What about Otho and Vitellius? Both of these fit in there in some sense. Well, in the, and that's the question, in what sense? In fact, the way the author here addresses this by using the term and eight is a giveaway that there is an issue, there's a problem here. The, the, the others are addressed as the uh, five, or things of this nature, a definite article. But when you get to the eighth, there's an indefinite article, and. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, the effort on the part of the author to say there is some confusion in the king list. Some people would consider these two people to be non-emperors, they usurped the throne, pretended to be, they weren't, they were killed, they moved on, and they were just usurpers with no legal claim to the, the title of emperor and the role of emperor. Uh, <clears throat> but, in fact, the author here isn't engaging in that debate. He gets around it just by uh, saying that as for the beast that was and is not, it is an ape that belongs to the seventh. His point is here, this one out here, Vespasian, uh, <clears throat> um, is of a, I think I used the word, not quantitative successor, but a qualitative successor to the seven. He's not necessarily numerically the seventh, he's qualitatively the seventh. Those other two, uh, <clears throat> Otho and Vitellius, however you want to identify them, in fact they were you know, small players on the scene, and qualitatively they didn't fit into the pattern of these tyrants. Tyrant as they may have been, small potatoes, questionable their authenticity, 
uh, and the propriety of a, a, a identifying them as a true emperor. Let's get around all that. Let's just talk about an ape. Somebody who qualitatively succeeds to those that we have no question about in terms of their authenticity as emperor. We have one who succeeds uh, that group of authentic emperors. And he belongs to the seven. Notice that he belongs to the seven. The very nature of the case is such he, he doesn't say he's the seven. Uh, because he's identified as an eight. But he belongs to that group that we've identified as often authentic emperors. Uh, that's what's being said here. And like the rest, he goes to destruction. So, we have Rome identified by its geographic symbols and by its leadership symbols. And that identification places it, I think, squarely in the period of uh, Nero as, and uh, following him, Vespasian. Remember, Vespasian was in Israel, pursuing the war there under orders from Nero. When Nero uh, dies, Vespasian pulls back his armies from uh, the battle and sort of garrisons his troops and takes a focus of what's going on in Rome. He's waiting for marching orders from whoever's in charge. They can't figure out who's in charge. But in the back of his mind, there is a prophecy, which you may or may not be familiar with, and the prophecy came from Josephus. Josephus was captured by Vespasian. Josephus was a Jewish general fighting Vespasian. And Vespasian destroyed him and his armies. And he tried to hide in the sewer system of the town that he was defending. Eventually was found and drug out and like so many, would have been put to death. But Josephus, in his uh, conversation with uh, Vespasian, says, in some way, shape, or form, I prophesy that you will be the next emperor of Rome. And that took Vespasian by surprise. Normally, he had to kill this man. And he uh, wanted to think about that. So he didn't kill him. And uh, he just imprisoned him and thought about it. And he got to know Josephus and he began to use him as some type of emissary to try to communicate with the Jews and uh, to question him and get intelligence from him and things of this nature. And so Josephus lived because of that. And all in the back of his mind, He's thinking, the next emperor, huh? And then Nero dies, and there's revolution. And the empire comes crumbling down to the point that it is nearly breaking up into ten different states across the Mediterranean Empire, something it did 500 years later. And just at this point, Vespasian pondering, of course, this prophecy, he'd be the next emperor, said, well, why not? You know, the rest of those clowns can't seem to get their act together. They keep killing each other, you see. And uh, the empire is uh, engaged in civil war. We've got rebellion all over the empire, from Great Britain to all across the empire. And uh, that was the reason it was so necessary for the Holy Spirit to convince these ten horns to maintain their loyalty to this cause because there was very little loyalty to Rome right now. And so <clears throat> we see uh, this uh, mess developing. And Vespasian steps up, goes to Rome, declares himself emperor, and is successful and is not killed and doesn't make himself uh, the, you know, the, the year of the four emperors. All of them, but just the three that died. How did the Jews feel about Josephus kind of um, almost being a friend? They, ha 
hated him at, to this day. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he was a priest, and he uh, was, you know, a person highly educated, and uh, someone that, that when they were passing out generalships, he got one of them because it was well thought of. But when he, in essence, just came to the conclusion, we, nobody can beat Rome. We're, we're, this is suicide. And he pleaded with them to, you know, stop the war, and, and in some way, shape, or form to come up with a peace treaty. And that was then and now. Uh, he thought very poorly of that. Jews, uh, I, don't, I think they missed uh, the point of what he has to offer in terms of Jewish history. Many, many of those continue to study him because he wrote. If you've never read Josephus, it's fascinating. He, in his uh, very thick book with small print, uh, Part of what he writes, he starts with the book of Genesis. And he starts telling you Jewish history. And history you didn't know anything about, a lot of it. And you'll be surprised to read it. Uh, it's the traditions, obviously, that he would have had access to at his point in time as a priest and a learned and scholarly man 2,000 years ago. But most of what he's written is found nowhere in later Jewish literature. It died out. And, and except for the fact he preserved it, we wouldn't know these opinions, right or wrong. But when you start in the creation in Adam and Eve, one of the things he tells us is that Adam and Eve had 62 children. Now that's not recorded in scripture anywhere, and it's probably a fact because of the explosive nature of the uh, population. And it uh, didn't take many generations, you know, at, at that rate. World was populated. And he gives you fascinating information on the history of Israel. You'll get no place else. It's worth reading. Uh, I'm just wondering, by him doing that, did that preserve Israel so they didn't get wiped out by Rome? They did get wiped out by Rome. Com but not completely, right? Completely wiped out. Right. The only people that survived were those who were not there. Oh. You know, the, uh, Jews across the empire who were not making war on Rome. And they did survive. But in uh, Israel, Every Jew was killed. Uh, approximately one million Jews were put to death by Rome. 100,000, according to Josephus, approximately 100,000 uh, were uh, alive when the war ended and enslaved. And enslavement in the Roman world meant death because they would work them to death uh, within the next couple of years. Uh, during you know, very difficult physical labor. They like to send a lot of them to the mines, the salt mines, the gold mines, things like that, where your life expectancy was about six months at best. Mm -hmm. you know, they'd have mine safety, you know. You mine by crawling in these claustrophobic little holes and digging out the gold and such like. And, and uh, life was indescribably difficult. And so this 100,000 people would have uh, die to a man and a woman and a child that they had captured because that's the way they would have treated them. Now, sometimes the Romans, if they felt inclined to be nice to their slaves, could have actually sold them in a different slave market in which they could be purchased as household servants and things of this nature. And their life may have not been as bad, depending on who bought them. Although they were considered uh, animals and could be put to death by the owner any time he chose. There was no legal reason why he could not. But they would be put on uh, as uh, oarsmen on these galleys, things like that. They would put those shackles on you and drive them into the, the, the timbers of the boat. And those shackles wouldn't come off until you were a dead man. And then they would take them off and throw you in uh, overboard and put somebody else and put those shackles on and you'd stay there until you died. That's, and you didn't, you know, didn't eat that well, and it was a very bad situation, to say the least. So my point is, uh, Israel, uh, geographically, not uh, outside of that geographic bounds, but geographically was, was pretty much destroyed. Now, Jews did actually come back uh, from the other part of the empire uh, to this vacant land and trying to 
recreate Israel again. And in fact, they rebelled against Rome on a couple more occasions. But they were small rebellions, uh, and again, they were wiped out with ease. You see. And uh, they're, finally, they stopped coming back and doing that. And for 2,000 years, pretty much, uh, were virtual strangers to the land. In verse 12, we pick up with a little bit more information. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. Now, <clears throat> you can see... Uh, the point I was trying to make, God, I think, uh, brought them to the point that they were of one mind in supporting the beast. That's important because of the civil war that was going on across the empire. And there would be no inclination to support Rome in this effort. So an army was brought uh, uh, to Israel with all the allied troops of the various regions that Rome controlled, the Ten Horns. You see what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense to you? Uh, any questions about that? These are one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war. Now here, <laughs> here is the proverbial monkey wrench. Think about it. We've got this war developing. <coughs> we got the allies coming together with Rome. We've got the harlot, of course, that, uh, that, that Rome is turning on and going to rend and destroy. And then we get to this point and we read, they will make war on the Lamb. Now, whoa, wait a minute. I thought we were making war on Jerusalem. Do you see the point? Anybody following the logic here? You get all these armies together to fight Jerusalem, and they said that they're going to make war on the Lamb. That was a, what I've been teaching, if they're going to make war on the Lamb, they make war on Israel and destroy it, which they did. Uh, in fact, you expect to read something like this after verse 13. Uh, <clears throat> go down to verse 16. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked, and devour her flesh, and burn her up with fire. Okay, that's what we expected to read at that point. Is it not the flow of the argument there? But something intercedes there that I wasn't expecting. They're making war on the Lamb. And the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. That verse just doesn't seem to belong there. It interrupts the flow, and the proof of that is, after that verse, the flow continues. But it is there, I think, to make the point that there is a bigger war going on. There's not only the war by the beast against Jer uh, Jerusalem and Israel. In fact, the beast has been attacking the church of Jesus Christ since about, what, 64 A.D. when Rome burned down and Nero blamed it on the church and it was, began the great persecutions and murders of the church. So in fact, the beast is being used by God to destroy Israel, but it's doing so with a delight that even, you, you might say, God doesn't have. <clears throat> because they see it as an opportunity to attack God himself. They don't realize they're far from doing that. And, uh, and, and attack Christianity. In fact, there are certain uh, documents that, uh, from Titus and others that uh, make it clear that the Romans thought they were going to wipe out Christianity as well as Judaism at this point. Because remember, Christianity since 64 has been on the hit list. You see, we're going to get them all. Because they're all Jews anyhow. But basically, the early church was a Jewish church. And only after the destruction of Jerusalem, when the 
church didn't seem to be impacted at all. Remember, 144,000 got out of Dodge. And the church of Jesus Christ continued and prospered. Did Rome, did it become obvious to Rome that these groups are not just Jews. They're, this is something new. So their uh, efforts there were to attack the church of Jesus Christ. That was their goal. They will make war on the Lamb. See how that fits in now, where it didn't look like it fit in at all. They're going to make war on the church and Jerusalem. See, they have a twofold goal, but they're not going to, you might destroy Jerusalem, ordained of God to do so, you're not going to destroy the Lamb. One animal, beast, so another animal, a lamb, who has the unfortunate quality of turning into a lion when he wants to. <laughs> you see? And so that's what the beast was facing, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Reminds you of, uh, of the books by C.S. Lewis. And Ans Anselm? What is it? Aslan. Aslan, yeah, the great lion. Uh, that's exactly the picture. The lamb will conquer them. Lambs don't conquer. The lambs that turn into lions do conquer. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. We discussed last week <coughs> Uh, who sat over this great mass of people? Was it the city of Rome or the Roman Empire or was it Jerusalem? And either makes sense. But we concluded that Jerusalem in this context was under discussion. That Jerusalem sat over an empire of synagogues and such like and controlled them by the whim of a word. They were slaves virtually to the... Uh, to the high priests and such like, and the synagogue leaders. <clears throat> and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beasts will hate the prostitute, which is where we thought this was going, and it is. They will make her desolate and naked, devour her flesh, and burn her with fire. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. There is a verse that I thought I listed in here. I don't, you know, I don't know why, but I'm so certain that I've listed a verse and can't find it. Uh, oh, here it is. Brother it in the margin. Leviticus 21.9. And I'll look up Leviticus 21.9 and read it to you. See if you can see the significance. 21.9. And the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. What's the significance of that verse to the context we're reading in Revelation? I think the significance <clears throat> is found in the fact that Jerusalem was in a you know, priestly relationship with God and has turned into a what? Harlot, which is exactly what we read in Leviticus, right? And what happens, according to the law of God, a, a harlot? She should be burned with fire. This was a unique, a unique punishment in the Old Testament. I don't know if there's another punishment of being killed by fire in the Old Testament. A unique punishment, because... Uh, Capital crimes were uh, exercised by stoning in the Old Testament. And here is, uniquely, in other words, this is so uh, disturbing to God that the, you know, the holy priesthood should profane itself with prostitution, that the punishment for that was to be burned with fire. And what do we read? In verse 16 of chapter 17, they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. I think the symbolism is what we're dealing with here. 
is that this wife of Jehovah, who has now become a prostitute, and this holy family of God, is going to receive the punishment reserved only for such holy office and for, and for such horrible sin. It's going to be uh, uh, destroyed, humiliated in every sense of the word, make her desolate. Uh, and uh, burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose. It is God who puts things in people's hearts or mind to do certain things. Um, <clears throat> we um, read in, uh, well, I don't know where we read it. <laughs> you got the wrong reference here. Uh, his purpose, by having a common purpose and giving their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God will be fulfilled. Uh, they have one purpose. God has created that purpose. His purpose. And uh, he's directing the affairs of these, uh, these people. Uh, we read in one place, one place in the uh, New Testament where Paul talks about Titus, that God had put it in his heart, the heart of Titus, to do certain things for Paul. And so this concept that God works in the heart uh, and uh, directs our uh, opinion of the, the behavior that we should be involved in is, um, is uh, substantiated by these verses. Uh, so they're of one mind and hand over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. We talked about the great city. It's a term used of Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, in the Bible, uh, or similar terms, uh, we read... Uh, in Psalm 48.2, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Sinai in the far north, the city of the great king. Uh, Josephus, describing the city, says uh, somewhere, okay, and where now is that great city, the metropolitan, metropolitan of the Jewish nation, which was fortified with so many walls round about, etc., etc., because of the great city. And obviously many towns or cities, uh, Rome amongst others, could be identified as a great city. But I would make the point that although we have options, and Rome being the most obvious option in some of this, that, and Rome is a major player about what's going on here, uh, the fact of the matter is, the book of Revelation, being a tale of two cities, the Old and New Jerusalem, not the Old Jerusalem and Rome. It's a tale of two wives, the wife of Jehovah and the bride of Christ. Rome is not one of those wives. It's a tale of two covenants, the Old Covenant and the New. And Rome has never been in covenant with God. And so, the flow of the book, and all the acts of Jesus I've been able to do, which is piecemeal as we, just, as, as we do exegesis of the passage uh, uh, you know, verse by verse. You don't gather it all together like sometimes you'd like because this information is spread out throughout the book. But every time I've come to this point, I'm trying to make the point that I think each part identifies this uh, woman, the city, this great city, as a Jerusalem. And that that's the story that's, that's flowing here. The destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And in fact, Rome was not destroyed. And others will say, well, that, you know, being a futuristic book, it will be. But in fact, it really doesn't fit because futurists take us into the distant future, which we haven't come to yet, 2,000 years later. And so it really doesn't. You 
don't know what to do if this was Rome. Because Rome's demise went out more like a whimper than it did like a great battle. Oh, there were battles. Rome lost battles. But, you know, it just happened over a period of several hundred years. You see, you don't... People often ask, well, when did the Roman Empire fall? Nobody can answer that. You probably ask it yourself or hurt it. Because, well, they lost this battle, but then they did this and came, and then they lost it. And, and then one day, somebody scratched their head and said, the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. Nobody's quite sure when that happened, you see. So we don't have this great battle in Rome that we see all through the book of Revelation, this great battle. But Jerusalem does indeed have this great eschatological battle. It fits perfectly to that context.